Yeah, you guys have been on tour for a long time. What do you do when you're bored? Oh. 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 It's a family show. I noticed, I noticed you pick your nose a lot. Why are you no, still always. picking his nose? Yeah, where were you, oh, Roddy? I masturbation. Hey, man, you want to come to my hotel room? Watch. <laughs> All right, so the band of the hour is none other than the avant-garde, experimental, alternative, heavy, but above all else, fucking amazing Faith No More. Fronted by the ever-charismatic Mike Patton, who is objectively the greatest singer on earth. And don't even try and argue that, because you'll lose every fucking time. Billy Gould's chunky bass work, making him one of my favorite bass players of all time. Just the way he rips that instrument is really something that I get inspired by whenever I try and play bass. Mike Bourne acting as the band's backbone, and Jim Martin giving the band their heavy edge, at least back in the early days. And how can we forget, Roddy Bottom fighting the keys that pretty much make this band, if you ask me. Now, with all due respect to every other member of this band, Roddy's the guy who really takes it from 10 to 11. But then again, you can say the same thing about anybody else who's ever been in this band. It's pretty goddamn amazing. And the main thing I like about them is their uniqueness, and a uniqueness that no other band seems to really have. Every album they've done is different from the one that preceded it, and I really would classify it as art. Not that it's necessarily better than anything else out there, any of the other records in my collection, but it's just got something to it that you can't quite put your finger on it that no other band really gets. In fact, I remember once I was talking to an old friend of mine, I was trying to recommend him Faith No More, all the albums. He said, oh, well, what did they sound like? And I was kind of stumped for words, because it really depends on what era, what album, what year we're talking about here. Faith No More reformed by Billy Gould and Mike Borden, originally back in 1979, but at first, it, it's not exactly the band that we all know and love today. They went through several names at first before finally settling on Faith No Man. And at this point, they released a double A-side single, Quiet in Heaven and Song of Liberty, which was ultra new wave and kind of gothic and really post-punk. And listen, you can definitely tell it's Puffy and Billy. I mean, they've got very recognizable sounds, even in their infancy. But the rest of the people in the band give you a very different sound. It's not something you can easily compare to anything else they ever did. It's kind of reminiscent of Pornography Era Cure, because even though it's ultra new wave, it's still very, very dark. But then Borden and Gould left that band and formed Faith No More, kind of ribbing on the fact that a man named Mike Morris, who's the original singer, wasn't there anymore, so Faith No More. Because Mike Morris's nickname was Mike the Man Morris, which is pretty odd. And as time went on, they eventually enlisted their entire classic lineup. Roddy came in, I think, 1983. Jim came in in 1984 or 5. But before they found the vocalist who would sing on their debut record, they found one Courtney Love, BC, before Cobain. She just talked her way basically into the band. Courtney said, what sign are you? He goes, cancer. I go, me too. When's your birthday? July 1st. Me too. I was like, wow. That was like kind of like kismet. That was my way of getting him to sleep with me. Now, I don't want to say Courtney Love is the reason Roddy turned out gay, but I am implying it. But by the mid-80s, they actually got a singer who Billy was actually somewhat familiar with because they met during some 70s punk gigs. And that guy's name was Chuck Mosley. And with a newly completed lineup, they recorded what would become their debut album, We Care A Lot. This album is weird as fuck for a debut record. People think the experimentation started in the early 90s with Angel Dust, King for a Day and stuff, but this album proves that the experimental side of Faith No More were with them from the very beginning. They're not like most other bands who define their sound first and foremost, then start experimenting. No, they started right off the bat, and that's pretty commendable. It has mixtures of metal, funk, alternative, post-punk, especially the aptly titled song Arabian Disco. It just has this infectious groove, which is only accented by Roddy's amazing keyboard lines. Then we even have
have songs like Jim, which is an acoustic kind of jam, sort of reminiscent of stuff Tony Iommi would do on the early Black Sabbath records. It's another example of how Jim Martin gave the band their edge. A lot of the heavy stuff that a lot of people love, like Surprise Your Dead and Jizz Lobber and stuff, you can thank Jim Martin for that. He's the guy who always brought that stuff to the table. My favorite song for the record has got to be As The Worm Turns, the absolute standout. It's epic and huge sounding, and in a day and age where Iron Maiden needs 17 fucking minutes to make an epic with 17 million fucking time changes, Faith No More could do that kind of stuff in their infancy in like three and a half minutes. It's pretty fucking amazing. Now I'm aware they re-recorded the song with Mike Patton during the Angel Dust sessions, but I don't know, it's just kind of missing the primal nature that this album has. Also, Mike kind of hams up his delivery to an extent, which is why I don't really like it when he sings Chuck's songs. Mike really does not sell this song, or any of Chuck's songs, as well as Chuck does, even though Mike's obviously the much better singer. Also, there's too much shit going in the background. Roddy seems like he's having a seizure at the keyboard. It just kind of pointless if you ask me. Some songs do definitely kind of fall flat. The production could definitely be better. The guitars and bass are kind of buried in the mix. The drums and the keyboards are the main instruments and they're quite overpowering and overwhelming. The vocals could really do with some reverb because they sound very, very dry. Dry as a bone, in fact. Even though Matt Wallace did produce it, as we all know, he also produced the next three albums from the span that all sound spectacular. So his production being weak on this album is kind of a blight on this man's resume. Because if you look through it, there's some superb sounding records on there. And I'm sure in the mid 80s, he did not have the experience that he would have later on, obviously. The guy was probably still learning at the time, so you gotta cut him some slack. And it's not just the producer who kind of falls flat in terms of his performance, because a lot of the instrumentation leaves a lot to be desired. But that's also due to the fact that they weren't fully formed musicians at this point. Especially Chuck, because at times he has trouble staying in the correct key, his voice can be very monotonous at times because of his lack of range, but the guy definitely has his strengths to speak of. In fact, one of his many unique quirks is he used to write lyrics just about fucking anything. Maybe the best example of this was the song Mark Bowen. The band used to send Chuck demo tapes before he formally joined the band, and because these were all instrumental ideas, they just wrote whatever for tracks instead of just writing track two, or track one, whatever. And they would just name these songs after random things. That's probably why the acoustic instrumental is just called Jim, because Jim wrote it. And they would name these demo tracks whatever the fuck they wanted, like after places and people they met. But when Chuck got the demo for this song in particular, he saw the words Mark Bowen, who was a former guitar player before Jim Martin came to the picture. So Chuck wrote the lyrics around a titular Mark Bowen, a man he has never met. Though I do like this album quite a bit, it's definitely my least favorite from this band, by far. In my opinion, there's just not enough substance to rank it any higher, but that's just a testament to how good they got later on. Or oh, by the way, you know who hates this album actually? Mike Patton. I can't remember the exact quote, but I remember him saying that it was just quote, new wave shit, or something along those lines. And tell me, I said earlier in the show that you were a bit like Metallica meets Perry Como. Would you agree with that? That about sums it up. <laughs> yeah? Who are your main influences? I don't know, what about Perry Como? Where'd you get that from? Well, I don't know, you know, what I mean is like, it's like a, a, a different opposites. Have right? my baby. Oh, that's Paul Anka. Oh. <laughs> oh we got oh. some of him too, though. Yeah. What started you off, though, musically? What made you want to be in a band? Batman. <laughs> From the first note on this album, you know that Introduce Yourself is going to be a far superior record to We Care A Lot. It's everything We Care A Lot is, but amplified. I mean, the record's even called Introduce Yourself. It's up front of how this album is the true debut from this band. It was the first album they did on a major label, so they had a much bigger budget, and with that came a much better production. In fact, you could argue that this album is basically just the real thing, but with Chuck Mosley singing. It definitely shows the direction they were going on. Highlighted tracks would have to be the title track, Introduce Yourself, which has a really cool punky thing going on. The Crab Song in Chinese Arithmetic for its great atmospherics that are just so luscious. With the latter song being one that has stayed consistent in the band's set list throughout the years. Sometimes with Mike even performing impromptu covers during the intro.
And it's one of the Chuck songs that still gets played consistently. Which is interesting because some songs that Chuck did, the band kind of avoid because they view it as too personal a song for Chuck. And Sung is probably the biggest example of this. They've never done that with Mike. There's even some spoken word sections on this album, like Family Man Era Black Flag, where you hear like Chuck yelling, getting pissed because the bus fare is too damn expensive at a whopping 95 cents. But that little spoken word section is actually the intro for one of the best songs of the Mosley era, Death March, with its gnarly fucking riffs. And when you listen to this song, you can tell that Jim Martin was definitely one of the big contributors of the song. I'm the guy used to be a bandmate of the one and only Cliff Burton. So it goes without saying he's gonna be a fucking riffmeister. And the song also showcases probably Chuck's best vocal performance ever. I mean, he really gives it his all. And of course we're gonna talk about the most popular song in the Mosley era, the re-recording they did of We Care A Lot for this album. This time around with slightly more topical lyrics and a better production, a punchier tempo, it just leaves the original version in the dust. And you might have picked up the fact that I didn't even mention that song on the previous segment when I was talking about the album We Care A Lot, even though it's the goddamn title track. And that's because that version, even though it's by no means bad, but in fact it's actually even grown on me in recent years, it just does not hold a candle to the version on Introduce Yourself. Really, it just has nothing on it. I'd say my favorite song off this album, my favorite song of the Chuck Mosley era in its entirety, is gotta be fucking Ann song. You could argue it's kind of hokey with its Why? Why? But if you ask me, that just gives the song its charm. I can't help but smile like a dumbass every single time I listen to the song. It's just got a certain kind of magic to it. On this album, the band started to make some real waves. They signed to Slash Records, the former indie label that released some of the finest hardcore punk records of all time. But at this point, they were basically a major, so they could promote the band very effectively. We Care A Lot got some airplay, and in recent years, it has been reappraised as a classic song by the band. They toured the UK, they even had a slot on a national tour opening up for another much bigger funk metal band. You may have heard of, they were kind of popular at the time, called The Red Hot Chili Peppers. No shit. Overall, Introduce Yourself is definitely the best album of the Mosley era, and I'll say I would put it up there with some albums like The Real Thing and stuff, because it does definitely has a charm, and a lot of people just kind of write it off, it's like, oh, no Mike Patton, I don't care. But if you're a fan of this band, especially their later records with Mike Patton, you owe it to yourself to give this album a listen. And that's right, I actually own all the records from here on out. I know, I spent my own money on this shit. Surprising, eh? Then after three years with the band, Chuck Mosley was kicked out in 1988 for erratic behavior, like apparently punched Billy Gold on stage for like no reason, falling asleep on stage, and substance abuse problems overall. It was kind of a mess, not gonna lie. It did seem like it was a flake, at least back in those days. He later went on to form some different bands, he released some solo albums, and weirdly enough, he actually replaced HR in Bad Brains for like six months. Which is pretty ironic because HR was one of the biggest influences towards Mike Patton. And when Chuck was fired, the rest of the band immediately went on the chase for a new singer. Jim had heard some of Mr. Bungle's demo tapes like Raging Wrath, The Easter Bunny, and Ball of Chili. So Jim was really on board with getting Mike. But the rest of the band were kind of eh on that because if you actually heard a lot of the early Mr. Bungle, it doesn't seem like it would necessarily fit. And believe it or not, Mike was actually quite apprehensive about joining Faith No More. I mean, hell, he was in Mr. Bungle, which was comprised of a bunch of people he grew up with and he went to high school with. So they obviously had one hell of a bond. But after talking with his bandmates and Mr. Bungle, it was decided that Mike could do both bands at once. And due to the publicity Mike would later get in Faith No More, it would lead to Mr. Bungle actually getting a major label record deal on Warner Brothers. Which is so odd, because under no other circumstance would a band like Mr. Bungle be on Warner Brothers Records. And talk about an upgrade in lead singers. We go from Chuck Mosley, who's kind of got one thing and he can kind of do it well sometimes, with Mike Patton who can do just about any sort of style and make it work. And with no disrespect to Chuck, because I dig his voice, but with Mike, he just took him to a whole different level. I mean, Mike has a range of six octaves, which is more than anybody else in recorded history. 
where Chucks maybe got one and a half octaves if he's lucky. Then on the cusp of the 90s, Faith No More with their new frontman, new lead singer, new lineup, they released what would become one of the defining moments of not just their career, but of rock and metal as a whole. Quotes that people have said about this next band. Um, I will be totally honest, the best album of the year is what Kirk Hammett and Metallica said. The most important album in the last two years, Rick Savage of Def Leppard. Slash says the new album is blank brilliant. And uh, just a lot of good reviews. I also think it's one of the best albums of the 90s. I've got Mike and Roddy from the band Faith No More. How you guys doing? Fine. Great, thanks. Now, you guys have obviously got a lot of uh, good reviews from some critics. Do you find that's kind of hard to live up to some of the stuff? No, not at all. We just been like doing what we're doing. I mean, it's really flattering that people say this stuff about us, but we just, you know, continue doing our shows pretty much. Does it put a lot of pressure on you? Or? No. No. Just having fun? Don't think about it at all. Okay. There isn't really a type of music that you guys would say that you are, though, right? Not really. Just hard rock, heavy rock, I would say. Mm -hmm. Death metal. Death metal? Death metal. Oh boy, the real thing. What can you say about this album that hasn't already been said? This album practically defined rock and metal in 1990. The hair metal bands are on the decline, but grunge and alternative bands haven't quite hit it big yet. People tend to forget, 90 was actually a pretty weird year in music. Also a very bad year in music. Seriously, look up what was burning up the charts in 1990, and you will find a lot of garbage. But not on this album. This album is such a staple of the early 90s, that it wasn't actually made in the 90s. Okay, it was released in late 89, but it didn't get popular until 90s, so fuck, it's a 90s record. And for me personally, it's an album so nice, I bought it twice. I mean, they sold so many copies of this album, and if anything, they should have sold more. And most of that is actually due to Mike Patton. Even though Mike's voice isn't quite developed yet, a lot of people rip on how he sounds on this album, saying he sounds like Spongebob. One minute's here, and one minute's there, and then you win the <laughs> Which, to be fair, they're completely on point. But you have to keep in mind, this is before Mike's voice had reached its final form, if you will. He only even sounds like Spongebob on both this album and the first Mr. Bungle record. It's not like he sounds like this throughout his entire career. But still, with all that being said, he still ripped shit on this album. Giving a performance most classically trained vocalists would kill for. From Out of Nowhere was both the first song on the album and also the first single, and my god, it punches you in the fucking gut. It shows all the naysayers what Mike could do behind the mic, and even the popular numbers are superb earworms that can and will get in your head. You have the almost synth-pop underwater love with hooks for days, but my favorite of the popular tunes has got to be the immortal classic that is falling to pieces. It's got a very memorable video, a chunky bass line that I can't get enough of, and it's no wonder why it's one of the band's biggest hits, which makes it even more puzzling why the band seemed to hate this song and stopped playing it live entirely in the early 90s. Rise Your Dead is heavy as shit and puts Slayer in diapers. It's these kinds of songs that make me low-key miss Jim Martin and his contributions, as much as I love the guitar players who came afterwards. His songs were always standouts, and his guitar tone was gnarly as fuck. There's also songs like the title track and Zombie Ears, which are two full-blown epics that hit you one after the other in the track listing. It shows everyone that not only could Faith the More write a catchy motherfucking song, they could write a song as long as eight minutes without boring the listener and leaving them wanting more. And of course, we have the Elephants in the Room, Epic. I mean, look, it may be way overplayed. I've certainly heard it a zillion times more than I can count. It's pretty fucking cheesy, and you could argue that it's pretty dated. You can also try and discredit it by saying how it influenced a bunch of shitty new metal bands like Korn and Slipknot. But a lot of the same people who make that argument also swear by motherfucking Pantera, so I wouldn't take their opinion very seriously. It's pretty fucking ridiculous to let that kind of stuff taint what you like and dislike and what you enjoy. The song is still a bona fide classic and nothing will ever taint that for me. So with all that being said, 
And as we all know, the song, or rather the song's video, is what caused the great Anthony Kiedis and Mike Patton feud of 90. Which Kiedis started by saying in a Kerrang interview at the time, My drummer is going to kidnap him, shave his hair off, cut off one of his feet so he'll be forced to find a style of his own. To which Patton responded, It just came out of the blue, it doesn't bother me one bit, I got a real kick out of it to tell you the truth. I mean, he's going to talk about me in interviews, that's fine, it's free press. Either he's feeling inadequate or old or something or whatever, but I have no reason to talk shit about him. News flash. News bulletin. Hot off the presses from America. Anthony Kiedis is a junkie. Oh, how times change. And that was pretty much it outside the occasional comment here or there for the next year or so. But 10 years later, long after Faith No More had broken up and Mr. Bungle are about to release their third album, California, their label decided to delay the release of the album by about a month because the original release date coincidentally was the same as the new Red Hot Chili Peppers album similarly titled Californication. Sometime after this, Kiedis got a really wild hair up his ass for whatever reason and decided to kick off Mr. Bungo from a bunch of festivals and tour dates that the Chili Peppers were also playing at. And since there were a far root of and they could give the promoters the ultimatum that either Bungle was playing or Bungle was yeah. playing. I mean, what do you think most promoters will pick? They don't care about what band is technically better or whatever. They care about what band will get most people buying tickets. And unfortunately, Red Hot Chili Peppers is that band. After that, Mr. Bungle decided to make fun of their rivals by dressing up as them during a Halloween show in Anthony home state of Michigan. After that, Kiedis got them kicked off of even more festival dates to which Anthony tried to claim the moral high ground by saying, Oh, I didn't care till I made fun of their band. Fuck them. Which is total crock of bullshit because this is continued behavior. Now he's trying to claim that Mr. Bungle are the ones that started it? Fuck you, Anthony Kiedis, and fuck your shitty overrated band, you fucking junkie hack. You effectively ruined the career of a band you're not even qualified to be in the same room with, let alone play the same festival with. Oh fuck, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, the real thing. It's kind of cheesy, dated in places by today's standards. And it's by far the most straightforward album the band ever made. It doesn't really take too many twists and turns, at least compared to the albums that succeeded it and even preceded it. But I still love this album nonetheless. It's a classic of its era and definitely worth buying. I think it's probably a good thing if computers just take over music. Because computers are a lot more messed up than people. And the more messed up and farther away music gets from music, the better, the healthier it's going to be for music. I think computers could kind of take it to a new level. I'm all for it. People are, people are the worst. It's the worst thing about music is that people play it. <laughs> now, as soon as you pick up the follow-up album, Angel Dust, you'll probably know something's a bit awry. First off, this album cover is really odd for a band like Faith No More. And the album cover is kind of like a nice little swan, but turn it around the other side and that's a fucking meat locker. Yeah, so um, if the lead singles didn't give you an idea of what this album might sound like, maybe the artwork will. I like it when this album starts off with Land of Sunshine. You almost think it's going to be a similar album to The Real Thing, because both this album and The Real Thing kind of sound similar at the very start of each album. Go back and listen. So for the first bar or two, you might think you know what you're in for, but then it just fucking drops, it goes into this chunky bass line from Billy that's almost kind of funky, with these really ominous background noises and vocals from Mike, and also these carnival noises and really fucked up manic laughing in the background you can hear. You know from the first track of Angel Dust, this is not going to be just another Faith No More record. Or just another record in general, it shares basically nothing with the real thing besides the fact it's the same band, same lineup. This album has been called, quote, the most uncommercial follow-up to a popular record ever. This is like the Beatles following up the White Album with Trout Mask Replica. I don't think anybody was expecting this, but looking back, maybe they should have. Mike Penn only wrote lyrics for The Real Thing. All the music had already been written. He's pretty much said, The Real Thing had been like someone else's band. It felt like an obligatory thing. They hadn't needed a damn singer, it was just that they had to have a singer. 
But after the real thing, the band took a little bit of a break, and Patton went back to Mr. Bungle for a bit. And during this time, they released the debut record. And this is the first time mainstream audiences heard what Patton really sounded like and what he was really all about. So when the band went to record what would become Angel Dust, not only could Mike Patton contribute more musically, but there's also a conscious effort to not play it safe. They are going to do whatever the fuck they wanted. Well, one member wasn't exactly on board, but we'll get to that later. There was a lot of tension with the band at this time too. Obviously, they had to follow up a multi-platinum record, so the pressure was astronomical. Because now there was an expectation to keep making hit records. At one point when the recording sessions were going less than ideal, the head of the label came down and said, I hope nobody bought houses. The press was constantly in the studio, which is why there's actually so much behind the scenes footage of this album. It's kind of hard to really focus on your craft and nail your performance when there's a fucking camera in your face at all time. Not to mention the band even fucking warned us during promotional interviews for the real thing, what their follow-up record might be like. I think that the next record is going to be more extreme, uh, <clears throat> more extreme in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, the, there'll be more extremes. There'll be more heavier, harder, and there'll be a lot softer, nicer. Uh, a lot of different moods. I mean, we're not going to put out a record with just one mood, because I, I don't see the point, personally. But I'm just going to come out and say it. All the shit they had to deal with during the recordings, I'm going to say it was fucking worth it, because this album's a goddamn masterpiece. And that's not an accolade I throw out very lightly. And I question in my top 10 albums of all time, probably even top 5. And I found this album at exactly the right time. I was getting low-key sick of a lot of the metal and classic rock I was listening to, though I still love it looking back. When I found this album was such a breath of fresh air compared to everything else I was listening to at the time, it opened up a whole new world of music for me. Throw a fucking dart and you'll find a gem. Malpractice is amazing for its brutal, visceral delivery, Mike sounds fucking sick and demented on the song, combined with the disgusting riffs, and how it contrasts with the downright beautiful bridge. Everything's ruined with Roddy's keyboards making everything sound epic and ginormous with a video that's actually maybe the best of their career because it was filmed off a cheap little fucking green screen and it's maybe the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Then there's Be Aggressive, which is literally about sucking dick. And No Shit actually kind of a brave song looking back because this song was written by Roddy Bottom, a gay man, but it was released a full year before he actually came out. And this was 10 years before people like Rob Halford broke down the doors for the gay community in the rock and metal scene, and you also have to commend Mike for not giving a single fuck and singing these lyrics even though he's straight. And Roddy originally wrote these lyrics as a practical joke for Mike to sing them. Cause you know for a fucking fact that most frontmen and bands out there wouldn't touch this song with a 10 foot pole, and for that I give this band massive props. As well as the eerie John Lord sounding keyboards with cheerleaders chanting combined with the funky riffs and tempo just wrap everything up in a very nice homosexual tone. Caffeine has one of the most brutal breakdowns in metal history if you ask me. While Periphery need a 37 string guitar to try and sound heavy, Ethan Moore could do it with just simple dynamic changes, and Mike's voice almost being an instrument in and of itself. We have Midlife Crisis, which was the lead single, the first thing off Angel Dust most people had ever heard. It's sample heavy, very dark, yet still catchy as hell. My favorite song of this album, maybe my favorite track of the band, has to got to be A Small Victory. From the lush instrumentation with the guitars and keyboards harmonizing with each other, and the lyrics that Mike wrote about his childhood, his dad used to be a coach for like a little league team or something that he was on, and he had to learn the hard way, but you can't always win. And I remember playing sports as a kid, and the rivalry between the children would get really vicious at times, even though on the grand scale of things, it does not matter at all. I think it says a lot about the human psyche and the society we live in. Especially the line, it shouldn't bother me, but it does. I mean, I think we've all been there before. The original pressing of this album used to end with a cover of the theme from the film Midnight Cowboy, which is a great way to end the album. After the listener just spent damn near an hour listening to an album that is so brutal, experimental, and above all else fucking jarring, it's smart to let people catch their breaths at the end with this really chill tune. But in all the reissues of this album, it ends with the band's cover of the Commodore's tune, 
easy. They covered it because they wanted something to replace their cover of War Pigs and their live set with something that would give less of a metal image for the band. And Loki, I don't think it fits to end the album quite as well as Midnight Cowboy. And every single time I listen to this album, I can't help but feel that Easy just kind of feels tacked on. Though regardless, it's still an amazing cover that stays true to the original while the band giving their own little Faith No More flair. This album is pure perfection if you ask me. I wouldn't change a note, I think it's that fucking good. But before we move on, we have to talk about the long-haired, bearded elephants in the room. That elephant being Jim Martin. And him leaving the band like I've already alluded to in this video. Now Jim Martin was not happy about the experimentation. He didn't like how there's less of a focus on guitars, which I could understand, but at the same time, Faith No More is never a guitar-centric band. The guitar was always used as just another instrument along with the bass, drums, keyboards, and vocals. And the band really just couldn't continue with Jim being at the guitar position. He still played all the guitar tracks on this album, despite some rumors that there were some session musicians. And even though he played on everything, he wasn't exactly involved in the writing, besides a few tracks here or there. And there's a real big distance growing between Jim and the other members. A lot of this is quite visible at the time, with Jim's own bandmates practically shit-talking him during interviews at the time. Speaking of disco, I know that our guitar player a little earlier said that he didn't like disco. He's one guy in five guys. And I would have to speak for at least three other guys in the band. We want to become a disco band. It's a lot like that. It's a lot of big egos really fighting each other. Yeah. One, really one, one in particular. Yeah. One in particular that like really lost out, but. Oh yeah? Who might that be? He's not here. He's not here. Man, you know, the guitar, guitar is usually just... an extension of the guitar player's dick. Yeah, that's the wank there. Yeah, yeah he, he didn't even describe that. I think everybody kind of knows that now. Everyone, anyway. yeah, that's like, it's got a little it's mirror tacky, on it. Man. That's one of those myths that is true. It's black and it's got a little mirror on it and stuff. It's kind of a really shitty thing to do, so you can't really blame him for being unhappy. And it's why you don't see Jim being interviewed around this era, like, at all. He didn't want to have any part of it. The band finally fired Jim Martin by fax in late 93. And there was even some rumors that Jim was homophobic towards Roddy. I believe these rumors came from Matt Wallace's end. And it makes no sense, because Jim was Roddy's bandmate for damn near a decade. I mean, one, I'm sure he knew about Roddy being gay far before that, and I'm sure he was fine with it. And hell, Roddy himself has even denied any claims of Jim being homophobic. But before Jim was fired, the band recorded a song with the hip-hop group Booyah Tribe for the Judgment Night soundtrack. A movie that came and went, but the main thing people remember about that movie is actually its soundtrack. Its main gimmick of having collaborations between rap and rock groups, but Faith No More and Booyah Tribe's song on the soundtrack was actually released as a single, and there's even a video release for it. And as you can see in the video, Jim Martin is nowhere to be seen, because he did not play on it, even though technically he was still in the band. Yikes. Instead, Billy Gould played guitar, and he does a fine enough job. Mike's only contributions are some spooky chanting as well as some of his signature screams and shrieks. Most of the actual vocals and raps are handled by the Booyah Tribe members themselves. And overall, I'd say it's a pretty damn fun tune, and I like what the Booyah Tribe brought to this track. Now we do live concerts and they'd say they don't even talk about the music or how good the concert was. They said, Mo, Mike didn't eat shit tonight. Yeah. I'm disappointed. Well, they've lost their edge. I suppose you're <laughs> sick of uh, speaking about this, but... Of course, uh, what you're not. Do you do with ourselves. Yeah, but, but uh, Bill Martin's uh, now left. Yeah, Bill. I'm oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> Jim Martin. Jim you Martin, know, little Joe. Yeah. Yeah. For a day, full for a lifetime. Now this is an interesting album. And you know, it kind of makes sense that the band would make a more stripped down record after Angel Dust, which has just such a huge wall of sound. And I can kind of respect that, because how are you supposed to follow up an album like Angel Dust? I'll tell you how you do it. You don't. You do a total 180 and do something different. Just like how they went from Real Thing to Angel Dust. They could have easily made the Real Thing part two, and it probably would have sold well, but they didn't. They took a chance, and I'd say it paid off. Same thing applies to King for a Day. But those paying attention probably know why this album is considerably more stripped down than the albums that preceded it. And that's because Matt Wallace is no longer in the picture. Matt Wallace, up to this point, produced every Faith No More record, 
and I think he did a damn amazing job. I don't think anyone else could have done better. But something to keep in mind for our listeners who are a bit more eagle-eyed than others is that in the last two records, the production was credited to both Matt Wallace and Faith No More. And that's because Jim Martin actually helped quite a bit behind the scenes, especially developing the sonic profile in the studio. So he insisted on the band having a co-producing credit. But the guy who took their place on this album, Andy Wallace, he produced and mixed Slayer's Rain and Blood. He produced Bad Religion, Stranger Than Fiction. He also has credits on classics from Sonic Youth, Rollins Band, and L7. This guy's resume up to this point is pretty damn respectable. Also, Roddy wasn't exactly there very much, mainly because his father and his friend Kurt Cobain died, so a lot of tracks on this album just don't have any keyboards, like at all. And Ronnie was the main reason Angel Dust had the sound it had, let's not forget that. He made that album sound huge. He made it sound like there was more than just five people in the band. Also something funny to keep in mind is at the time when they would play songs like Dig in the Grave that had no keyboards on it, whenever they played them live, Roddy would actually pick up a guitar and start playing. Horribly. <laughs> And of course, like I already mentioned, Jim Martin is no longer in the picture. And that guy's tone is always so identifiable with his era of Faith No More. It's very, very thick. And it's hard to replicate that, so it's good they didn't try to. Because on this album, they got Trace Bruins from Mr. Bungle. And listening to the guitar work, you can kind of tell it's him because it sounds very Mr. Bungle-esque at times. And it's pretty unfortunate that he didn't stay in the band because his playing on this album is fucking great. And he has some really cool chemistry with Billy, Puffy, and Roddy. And of course, Mike. The band said he couldn't commit to a full proper tour, where Trey says it was only ever agreed that he record the one album and that was it. Which is kind of weird, but Trey himself said the whole reason he threw his hat into the ring to play guitar was because he saw the shit they are going through at that time. Because being of course bandmates with Mike, he knows what's going on with Faith Damar, he threw his hat into the ring saying, hey man, I'll help you out. Which is pretty damn cool of him. When it came time to tour for this album, the band's former roadie Dean Manta took over the position of guitarist. Though Trey did join the band on stage in 2011 to perform this album in its entirety to a crowd of 70,000 people in Brazil of all places. Now I do love this album, don't get me wrong, in fact sometimes it's even my second favorite Faith and More record, but I feel it lacks a sense of cohesion that Angel Dust has because this album is very eclectic. Probably even more eclectic than Angel Dust, believe it or not. And some people would probably like it better for that reason. Angel Dust's eclectic nature was different because they would mix genres together and you get speedball gems like Land of Sunshine or Crack Hitler. Whereas this album's eclecticism is more contained in individual tracks. Like, oh, this is a punk song, this is a metal song, this is a jazz song, this is a lounge song, this is a motherfucking gospel song. Sometimes it seems like this album is lacking a sense of identity, regardless of how good some of these songs are. It really does detract from the album as a whole, and some songs like Star ID really fall flat, I'm sorry to say. Though when the album works, it works magnificently. One of my favorites would be, of course, The Gentle Art of Making Enemies. A great title with a great song to boot, with the sporadic riffing from Spruance and Patton's manic delivery, it's an absolute classic. Get Out is a great, fast-paced, punky kind of song, and it grabs your attention immediately when you start listening to the record. The last track, Just a Man, is amazing. It's part classical music, part gospel, but with a good dash of Mike Patton-branded craziness thrown in there for good measure, and it's a great way to end the album on such a high note. Faith is Bottle is about alcoholism and a poor soul whose life has just been ruined by addiction, and it's actually really fucking heartfelt. And this is not a look you see this band wear very often, but they fucking pull it off great. Though there is one song of this album where they kind of capture the vibe of Angel Dust. Strangely enough, it's the title track, King for a Day. It's one of few songs where Roddy definitely makes his mark, and has a really nice crescendo and great dynamics that this album actually at some point lacks, if I have to be honest. And you could argue that the song title and the album title is reflective of the band's career at that point. Because the days of Epic were far behind them, they had lost their guitars in many years, Angel Dust, even though it was a phenomenal record, failed to live up to the real thing. Roddy was out of commission for the most part. Mike, Puffy, and Trey were all involved in a really bad car accident at this time too. The band were at an all time low. The repeated line, don't let me die with this silly look in my eyes, is dark as hell. And the song is definitely one of the finest moments of this band's entire career. Look at 
to start with you we hear that uh, you circumcised yourself in a bizarre fishing incident recently is that true it's <laughs> kind of a mean way to put it um, <laughs> actually what happens is now i play sometimes lower notes on my bass because uh, i've been uh, surgically uh, corrected <laughs> so you've not seen each other for months on end apparently until you reassembled to do this little trip H how's it going is it great to see one another again? It's great now that Billy's circumcised, yeah. <laughs> I want to let all you guys in on a little secret. It is an album of the year. The best album of the year. Now, the album of the year... I think they kind of knew that this would be their last record, at least for a while. On the cover is an old Czechoslovakian politician, I believe he was the Prime Minister or something. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if you look at the back, that's a funeral. Also, if you open up the jewel case, the disc, yes I know this jewel case is all kinds of fucked up, but look, I got a eBay used for like five bucks. You see, that's another funeral, and when we open it up, we get yet another funeral of this man on the cover. It's fucking dark. And no, Album of the Year is just the album title. It's not a, an award they want. Okay, whatever, I can't. The band fired Dean Mansa because he really couldn't write with the band. They didn't really have any of that kind of writing chemistry with them. So they got a new guitar player, John Hudson, who I think did a pretty damn good job overall. He's not a crazy riff machine like some of his predecessors, but he does know how to fill out the sound with the guitar playing. That's all a band like Faith the More really needs anyways. Like previously mentioned, they're not a guitar focused band. They're not cacophony, and thank God for that. The production, I think, is also something that must be discussed because it is produced by both Billy Gould and Raleigh Mossiman, I believe it's pronounced. He produced the first few Swans records and Celtic Frost's Vanity slash Nemesis, and it's also the first Faith the More album they recorded using computer based program Pro Tools, which the band had never done before up to that point, and it was because of this we have tracks like Mouth to Mouth, because at first the band weren't exactly digging it. But Raleigh did a little bit of trickery on his computer, changed some things around, and the band ended up actually liking it from then on out. And the song, as we know it, was birthed from there. This sound probably has the exact opposite that King for a Day had, where it felt very eclectic at times, you couldn't really find a groove. This sound kind of has the opposite problem, where outside of a few tracks, a lot of the songs feel kind of samey. I think this is the most straightforward album they've done since The Real Thing. That's kind of a shame, especially considering this album is produced by the guy who had a hand in fucking filth of all records. It seems like the band was almost playing it safe, because King for a Day didn't exactly set the world on fire. But at the same time, it's almost hard to complain, because on this album we have songs like Ashes to Ashes. That question, a standout on the album, and one of the best of their career by far. With punishing riffs courtesy of John Hudson, and Mike knocking it out of the fucking park with his vocal performance. You might have noticed that Mike's technical performances is not something I've brought up very much in this retrospective. And that's because it kind of goes without saying, everyone knows how great of a vocalist Mike Patton is. Even people who don't even care for any of his music have to give him props for his technical ability. But on the chorus, he's so fucking powerful. It sounds like 10 men are singing, but it's only Mike, and that's a goddamn testament to the man's talent. The opening track, Collision, is both explosive and ominous. Helpless is a droning jam. Make it in front of a computer and got that feeling are full of energy. They have like a punk or hardcore feeling to them, which I love. She Loves Me is practically a boys to men song, and the keyboards and Last Cup of Sorrow are fantastic. It's a lovely little earworm that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, with definitely one of the best music videos of this band's career. As I think this album is, and even though it's gotten much better approval in later years and has been reappraised as a classic record, the album kind of got slaughtered by critics. Rolling Stone gave it a 1 out of 5, Pitchfork gave it a 2 out of 10, 
And even though I quite enjoy this album myself, I can't really say I fault them for thinking that way. I'm not going to give a kid a copy of Album of the Year if he's never listened to this band before. And I don't think Mike Patton liked this album much either since he gave this quote in 2001. We split because we started to make bad music. I'm sure our next album would have been a piece of shit. Jeez, buddy, tell me how you really feel. And despite the title, Album of the Year, which seems like it was really just tempting fate at that point, I didn't really feel comfortable giving it that accolade. Ah, uh, then again. But look, regardless of how the critics or even the band feel about this album, I still say this. If the band never got back together, and Album of the Year was essentially their epitaph, Pristina is a more than worthy way to bookend their entire discography. It's haunting, very dark, and apparently it's about two lovers separated by war. It's very poignant to be the band's final song. And the repeated lines of I'll be with you, I'm watching you, takes the song to a whole different level. And for this song alone, I will say that Album of the Year is definitely worth picking up. During the touring cycle for Album of the Year, things became a bit volatile. First off, their record label made them take Limp Bizkit as an opening act for them, a band they actually influenced unfortunately. And the band was really pissed about it because why wouldn't you? Fred Durst would even antagonize the audience by calling them fags. Yeah, I'm sure he openly gave keyboarders to appreciate it, that buddy. Most of the members couldn't even really commit to Faith No More full time because they all started to get their own side projects, not just Mike. So the band canceled their upcoming tour supporting Aerosmith and they played their last show in August of 1998 in Portugal, and from then on out, they called it quits. Roddy Bottom would continue playing with his band Imperial Teen, he even did some film scores, including Fred the Movie, Fred the Movie 2, Fred the Show. <laughs> Mike Borden played with Ozzy for a number of years, playing on several records and tours. John Hudson didn't really do much of anything musical outside of writing some songs with Billy that never ended up going anywhere, mainly because he started working the boring world of property management. Which is a damn shame because he's more than a capable guitarist and I'm sure he could have done something worthwhile. But hey, the guy needed to get paid, so fuck. Billy Gould played with Jello Biafra, he played in a supergroup called Fear in the Nervous System, did some work with Fear Factory, and even did some production work. Mike Patton, as you all probably know, had a hand in a boatload of musical projects. He founded his own label, Ipecac Recordings. He played with Mr. Bungle until they broke up in 2004. He formed the supergroups Phantomas and the Tomahawk. He released some solo records, did some acting. He was even offered to replace Michael Hutchinson in Excess, which is all kinds of odd, even for Mike. When asked about it, Mike said he didn't even really give it a moment's notice to think about it, as well as some other choice words. Come on, when you ha hung up the phone, maybe a few pictures came into your head of you being on stage playing some of those songs, no? It, it all, no, 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 no. It all involved uh, it, it, uh, some, showing up for rehearsal with, with, uh, with, uh, with something around my neck, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, I'd say I'm surprised, but I'm really not. But for about 10 years, all was quiet on the Faith No More front. The members never had anything bad to say about each other, but they were all happy doing their own thing. Until some rumors spread about a reunion tour. Billy Gould was quick to shoot them down, but less than a few months later, they started their own reunion tour entitled The Second Coming. But the lineup that reformed was the most recent lineup with John Hudson, not Jim Martin. Now the band did originally reach out to Jim Martin, but accounts kind of vary on what happened. The band said that they just simply grew apart from Jim, which is verily understandable. Whereas Jim says that out of nowhere when he called their management, they just informed him that they decided to go on with John Hudson. So I don't really know who to believe, I don't know, I'm just glad the band got back together to begin with. Jim was also asked to make some special guest appearances, like Trey Spearman's did playing the whole King for a Day record, except they wanted to do the entire Angel Dust album with him, which would have been fucking great. But Jim didn't exactly feel comfortable with something like that, so he declined. Then they just kind of toured for a couple of years, and new music was barely, if ever, discussed. But this is Faith No More we're talking about. They're not one of those bands to just rest on their laurels and to just live off the past. As early as 2011, the band began teasing new material on live shows. But in 2015, this album was released upon the world. What was it like being back together in the studio again? Was it like slipping on an old pair of slippers? It was like that old pair of slippers you have in the attic that you're wondering, should I put those back on my feet again or not? <laughs> they could be like spiders living in there or something. Or do I get a new model? <laughs> yeah. 
the sort of getting to know each other process again happened when we did a reunion tour, yeah. where we didn't have any new music on the horizon or anything, and there was no um, uh, uh, pressure to do so. It was a lot easier than I think we thought it might have been. Totally. I mean, just everything we did back in the day was really contentious all the time, so this was, this was better than that. So where you I'm talking on your cat. When this album came out, a lot of people didn't really know what to think, including myself. It took me a really long time to really get it. It's not an album you can just understand first listen. It's something you really gotta live with. In fact, I think I'm still living with it, because after listening to it to make this video, I think I like it more than I ever did. I'm convinced this is definitely one of the band's finest moments of their entire career. And let's keep in mind, this is a discography filled with finest moments of their career. Keeping with tradition, this album is far different to everything that has preceded it. And that's just the way I like My Faith No More. It's sporadic as fuck all over the place, and god dang, I love it that way. The album starts with a really pretty piano piece courtesy of Roddy, then the band kick in with a really eerie and dark mid-tempo jam that, as a Faith No More opener, is kind of outside the box. It's an album opener unlike any other this band has ever done. Every other first track on every other Faith No More album is either really anthemic or really up-tempo. This song is neither. And just just how much this band has grown in the 18 years since Album of the Year. Having the title track so Invictus open the album the way it does. If this was the same band who recorded even King for a Day, they would have definitely put like Superhero or something, the second track, as the opening track. Which that's a great song too, don't get me wrong. It probably would have worked great as an opening track as well. But the fact that they chose this song just shows the kind of direction they're heading in. This ain't shit dad's faith in the more, for sure. This time around, Billy Gould takes sole production duties, and I must say that producing all those other bands in between Album of the Year and this really paid off because this album sounds magnificent. And thanks in no small part to Matt Wallace coming back into the fold and helping with final mixes for the album. And this is the first time that Matt Wallace has worked with this band in decades. This isn't the same band that he knew that recorded Angel Dust, The Real Thing, Introduce Yourself, and We Care A Lot. They lost Jim Martin and everyone else in the band has mastered their craft to the highest point of their ability. And even though Matt Wallace had a hand in the production, it sounds nothing like the first four records at all. This album's production is super gloomy and gothic. I remember a quote from the band at this time was saying that this album is like a Beach Boys album through a gothic car wash or something like that. And listening to a track like Black Friday, it's pretty damn hard to argue. My name future regret Sunny Side Up is a really great song, and it's about an egg eating and, and eating breakfast. Look, I'm fucking dumb, so look elsewhere if you want insightful lyrical analysis on this track. Though I'd say my two favorite songs of this album come one right after the other, and that's Motherfucker and Matador. Motherfucker was the first single and the first new Fake the More song people got in nearly two decades. Some people didn't know quite how to feel, but in my opinion, it kind of makes sense. It's almost kind of drawing back to Epic because it got spoken word sections, which is really reminiscent of the rapping sections in Epic. But of course, because it's on this album, it's super gross sounding as compared to the funky fresh rhymes that was on Epic. So it's not like they're repeating themselves, but they're kind of calling back in a way. And thank God they didn't try and repeat themselves and write another Epic, because that would have been so goddamn pathetic at this stage in their career. But thankfully, this band is far smarter than that. And Matador is actually the first new song that the band actually began playing live in the early 2010s. Hearing this song relieved everyone to know Faith No More weren't fucking around with this reunion thing. With its sweeping instrumentals, the post-punk atmosphere, Patton's glorious vocal performance, and its magnificent crescendo. If you ask me, it's return to epics like the title tracks of King For A Day and The Real Thing. And even though I may be killed in some circles, I would go far as to say it's even better than some of them. Back From The Dead is the final track on the album, and it's actually kind of a happy tune, believe it or not. And happy isn't exactly a word anyone would ever use to describe this band or their music, especially on an album as grim as this, I'm aware. But I'll be damned if they don't pull it off. And knowing that it's about the band getting back together makes it even more heartwarming, I absolutely love it. Welcome home, my friend. We put 
and ends maybe the greatest comeback record of all time. Because let's think about it, not too many comeback records are even fucking listenable, it seems. But that's another testament to how good this band was. You won't catch them releasing an album like 13 or Psycho Circus, I fucking assure you. And that puts an end to the amazing discography of Faith No More. Not a bad album in the bunch. Sure, not everything was a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, but not every album needs to be a 10 out of 10 masterpiece. But everything this band always did was at a consistent level of quality that most of their bands couldn't even dream of touching. And that's more than enough for me. Since this album's tour, all was quiet for a while, until they announced that they're gonna reissue their debut album, We Care A Lot, with a remastered disc and a live show. And normally I wouldn't talk about this kind of stuff, because who fucking cares? But to promote the re-release, they actually did some full shows with Chuck Mosley on vocals, which is super cool to see, because you very rarely see that from bands. You very rarely see bands play entire shows with former members, it just doesn't happen. And especially with Chuck, sure he would occasionally guest at some shows where he was in town, but watching him up there on stage blasting out songs like Chinese Arithmetic, We Care A Lot, and Song, As The Worm Turns, I can't help but let it put a smile on my face, it's fucking great to see. But unfortunately on November of 2007, Chuck Mosley sadly passed away at the age of 57 of a heroin overdose. Rest in peace my man, may you forever care a lot in the afterlife. Now a few months ago, right after the news of a Mr. Bungle reunion, which nobody saw coming, it was announced that Faith No More would come back for their first shows in years with Mike Patton in Europe. Right now, there's no talks of whether or not this will lead to more dates or even to any new music, and the band's been quick to say that there's nothing really planned as of right now. Which is kind of disappointing, sure, but hey, Soul Invictus is a great way to end their career if they feel so inclined. So even if they never make another record again, I think I can be happy with that. So with that, I'd like to give a toast to the band of the hour, Faith No More. They were never briefly hip to trends, trends were only ever briefly hip to Faith No More. They want a few bands to truly say that they do not give a fuck and actually be honest with themselves. So may you magnificent bastards forever ride to the sunset. You deserve it. Cheers, everybody. Wait, why'd I start walking out? This is my own house.